Welcome back to the Hardware Unboxing News Corner. Decent week of news has just passed, some interesting stuff has happened and a few cool product launches. April can be a bit slow as we grind our way to Computex at the end of next month, but there are some interesting goodies in here, so, well, let's get on with it. One of the most recent releases from this week is NVIDIA's new GPU driver that unlocks ray tracing for owners of Pascal and Turing GTX graphics cards. Driver version 425.31 is now available and provided you have at least a GeForce GTX 1066GB or faster, you'll be able to use various ray traced effects in games such as Battlefield 5, Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Metro Exodus. NVIDIA first announced support for ray tracing on Pascal last month and the driver has arrived as promised. But to go along with the release, NVIDIA has also delivered a series of benchmarks to show how Pascal GPUs stack up compared to current Turing RTX GPUs with the company's RT cores for proper ray tracing acceleration. The general theme when looking through these charts is that in the best case scenario, according to NVIDIA at least, the GTX 1080 Ti performs a little below the RTX 2060 with ray tracing enabled with DLSS not factored in. However, as you increase the number of ray tracing effects and the intensity of those effects, the RTX 2060 pulls even further ahead. For example, the 2060 is pretty close to the 1080 Ti and Shadow of the Tomb Raider with RTX shadows, but in Metro Exodus with global illumination, the RTX 2060 is well ahead. In the Atomic Heart demo with both reflections and shadows, the 1080 Ti is only half as fast as the RTX 2060. It's also interesting to see the Turing GTX 1660 perform above the GTX 1070 across most of the charts. With ray tracing disabled, the GTX 1070 is generally the faster card. Nvidia said that Turing's ability to run FP and int instructions simultaneously does give Turing GTX cards a performance advantage over Pascal. Pascal, which does not have that ability, although naturally Turing GTX still falls well behind Turing RTX. I guess it's also impressive to see that yes, having the RT cores in the design does seem to be more efficient than brute forcing ray tracing on more CUDA cores. For example, the GTX 1080 Ti with its GP102 GPU is 471 square millimeters, whereas the RTX 2070 with TU106 is a little smaller at 445 square millimeters. However, the RTX 2070 is significantly faster in ray tracing according to Nvidia's numbers. There is a different process node involved here as well, but generally this does show that for ray tracing specifically, including those cores was better than adding simply more CUDA cores. Of course, this data should be taken with a grain of salt because it comes straight from Nvidia and naturally they do have an incentive to make their RTX cards look better than their older offerings so people will upgrade. In fact, even just releasing this driver support for ray tracing on Pascal seems to be designed to encourage upgrades. Owners of Pascal cards can now see just how horribly their GPUs will perform while knowing that performance will be a lot better on an RTX card. If you can't see how bad the performance is for yourself, it can be a bit easy to dismiss how hard it is to run ray tracing, but now you might get a bit of envy when you can't run these games with every effect cranked up to the maximum. We'll have our own investigation to Pascal ray tracing in the coming days, so look out for that to see whether Pascal can perform any better than Nvidia is showing here. In related news, Nvidia also released three new ray tracing demos that you can try out either on Pascal or on Turing. We have the Star Wars Reflection demo, plus demos for upcoming games Justice and Atomic Heart. Both Justice and Atomic Heart combine ray traced shadows and reflections for more ray tracing than we've seen in currently released games. Intel's Core i9-9990XE is now on sale, sort of. This monster CPU that sits atop Intel's Skylake X refresh lineup was previously supposed to be an auction-only product for OEMs and other system builders. Well, it seems that at least one system builder and retailer who bought some of these CPUs has decided to sell it as a standalone CPU in addition to building PCs with the chip inside. CaseKing.de have put up the 9990XE for 3,000 euros, which puts it at a US pricing of around 2,800 US dollars. This is a lot to pay for this sort of CPU, however it does offer the highest single core frequencies and the highest base clocks of any of Intel's HEDT processors. It does only have 14 cores as opposed to 18 in the 9980XE, but it trades a 3GHz base clock and 4.5GHz turbo in the 9980XE for a 4GHz base clock and 5GHz hertz boost in the 9990XE. Depending on your workload, the extra frequency of these cores is important, especially for something like gaming which isn't normally suited to HEDT CPUs. 
Of course, at this price, I don't imagine too many gamers will be rushing out to drop nearly $3,000 on it, given most people will be fine with a 9900K at a fraction of the price. It will also be interesting to see how popular the CPU is or how sought after it becomes. Relative to both the 9980XE with its increased core count and mere $2,000 price, as well as Intel's new 28 core HEDT CPU, the Xeon W3175X, which is around the same price at $3,000. TSMC's 5 nanometer technology technology is on track. The company has completed development on the necessary tools for 5 nanometers and is moving into the risk production stage, with high volume production expected to be on track for 2020. TSMC's 5 nanometers, which the company is calling either CLN5FF or just N5, is using their second generation extreme ultraviolet lithography tools. The first one with these tools has been used for the upcoming 7 nanometer plus node. TSMC have also given a few preliminary performance metrics for 5 nanometers compared to their current 7 nanometer node. We're not going to get a huge jump like the transition from 16 nanometers to 7 nanometers, but TSMC are expecting a 45% reduction in area, as well as either a 20% reduction in power consumption at the same performance, or a 15% increase in performance at the same power consumption level. With 7 nanometer plus sitting about halfway between 7 nanometers and 5 nanometers, we're going to get a gradual improvement over the next few years from this sort of technology. Next up, we have the official announcement of AOC's AG353 series, headlined by the AG353 UCG. Now, if you've been paying close attention to the display market and remember some of these terrible product names, the AG353 UCG was actually first announced around a year ago as part of NVIDIA's ultra-wide G-Sync HDR lineup. This panel is meant to be 3440x1440VA, 200Hz maximum refresh rate and has full proper HDR support. In fact, it wasn't just last year that we first heard about these displays. At Computex 2017, we first saw models from Acer and ASUS, which were subsequently delayed until the end of 2018 and today still aren't available. So. It's been a long process for these particular panels. In any case, AOC is finally ready to release the AG353 UCG onto the market, saying it will be coming in June 2019 at an undisclosed price, although TFT Central believe this launch date will end up around September or October at the end of it, with a price of 1800 to 2200 euros. That is very expensive, but this is a super high-end G-Sync HDR panel with Display HDR 1000 certification. It's essentially meant to be an ultra-wide equivalent to the 4K 144Hz G-Sync HDR monitors we've already seen. In addition to the AG353 UCG, AUC has announced there will be a FreeSync 2 variant, hopefully with identical specs including a crucial 512 zone full array local dimming backlight. I'd be disappointed if that backlight was exclusive to the G-Sync HDR model, but you never know. As for the competing Acer Predator X35 and ASUS ROG Swift PG35VQ, still no word on when those models will be available, but you'd think it would be around the same time as the AOC model for around that 2,000 euro or more price tag. Couple more quick monitor stories I wanted to bang through before the end of this news corner. One is that ASUS has unveiled its first mini LED monitors. These are designed to be professional grade monitors rather than gaming monitors, and as such pack a 4K resolution at 60 hertz and reproduce 97% of the DCI-P3 spectrum and come with a whole bunch of creator specific features. But the cool thing about these mini LED designs is in the HDR capabilities. The larger 32 inch PA32 UCX has 1000 local dimming zones, more than most current LCDs of this size. The 27 inch model has 576 zones as well, again very impressive for a monitor. Both can do 1200 nits of peak brightness so they can get display HDR 1000 certification. Now before you get confused, mini LED is not the same as micro LED. Micro LED is a tech that basically allows for per pixel local dimming with LCD technology similar to an OLED. This tech is still years away. Mini LED is a stepping stone on the way there. It's a new backlight technology and it allows for these high zone count local dimming arrays. Hopefully we see them in gaming grade monitors soon. We also have news of an 8K 120Hz display from Sharp with HDR capabilities including 800 nits of peak brightness. It's a 32 inch panel using IGZO technology. Not many other details were disclosed but still a cool look at what is coming in the next few years. 
Final story for the week, we have a few leaks for the upcoming NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1650. As expected, this is a short card without a power connector, which indicates the card will draw less than 75 watts of power. This Zotac card is a dual slot design with HDMI, DisplayPort and DVI connectors, while the cards from Gainwood and Pallet that have leaked have just HDMI and DVI. All these cards come with 4GB of GDDR5 memory and are expected to feature NVIDIA's Turing TU117 GPU. If we're getting full leaks like this, it shouldn't be too long until the 1650 hits store shelves. We'll be very interested to see where it ends up performance-wise. That's it for this week's News Corner. As always, you can subscribe to get the segment in your inbox every Friday. Consider subscribing to us on Patreon to get access to our exclusive Discord community and monthly live streams. I'll catch you in the next one.